Welcome to Luna's Apothecary for Existential Ailments and Millennial Agony. I will be your serving doctor today, and I can see you're checked in for quite the appointment. Bloody hell. Shall we begin? I am, believe it or not, right beside the Shard in London in an attic. And inside this attic, which you have to climb a whole lot of stairs to get to, is the oldest surviving surgical theatre in Europe. The Old Operating Theatre is one of my favourite places to come in London. It's one of the first museums I came to when I moved to London. And I think you can agree there's a little bit of magic here that I can't quite describe. Originally it was used to store herbs and medicines, but in 1822, they built this so they could operate on people and students could watch. Also might remind you of a particularly harrowing scene in the series of unfortunate events. Now, I'm not saying this place is haunted, but I'm saying exactly that. For those of you who are new here, I sometimes do these Agony Ant um, style videos where I answer your questions. And during COVID, I've been trying to take you to places that you might not get to go otherwise. Like lots of beautiful shared history during this strange year, the old operating theatre hasn't been able to welcome guests like it usually would. So I'm gonna leave some links below where you can look at donating and helping them stay open. Please. This is so much more gross and so much more interesting than so many of the London. Not that I should pit them against each other, but really, genuinely, this is a hidden gem. So if this looks like somewhere you'd like to visit in the future, I'm gonna leave the links below where you can help them out. Lots of you sent me your questions and ailments and existential illnesses on Instagram, and I'm gonna be attempting to answer a few of them. It's a delicate procedure, so I'm sorry if I make your nose go red. <laughs> A lot of you were asking me about how to make decisions and particularly one person asked, how do you make a huge life decision without worrying that you'll regret it? V is for valid. This is a valid worry. And I think that people who kind of trivialize it a little bit and are like, viva la resistance, just do what you like, do what feels right. And um, <clears throat> that can be a bit reductive and can also not really tell you what to do because how many of us really know our real feelings? Really? Most of the time, I can't even tell whether I'm hungry or bored. Now, I love a good decision. I do. A lot of dead people fought for our right to them and avoiding making a decision can often store your life more than making the wrong decision. So I'm going to give you a trivial answer and then I'm going to give you some serious answers. The trivial answer is for those trivial decisions that you just can't make. They don't really matter, but they kind of hold up your whole life while you scroll Netflix thinking, but what if this isn't the film for this Wednesday? If there's two of you and you're trying to pick between like, say like 10 options or an unlimited amount of options. One of you picks five things. From those five things, the other person picks three things. And from those three things, the first person picks the thing. This can work for holidays, films, dinner options, ballot papers. I'm joking, don't resolve your ballot papers that way, guys. Let's try and avoid politics being even more of a Russian roulette than it already is. This guy was trying to pick between two books, couldn't. Now look, can't make decisions when you're dead. Love this solution, but it probably doesn't apply to those big decisions. And somebody asked, how do you make a big life decision without the debilitating worry that you've made the wrong one? I've got three options for you for that. And um, if you can't pick between the three options of how to make a decision, then I don't know if I can help you. <laughs> So the first one is make a pro cons list, but I was told this a lot and it kind of bugged me because it never really worked until I realized not all pros were created equal, nor are cons. So what you do is you make a pro cons list and then you score the pro or the con depending on how important that thing is, in, is to you or how much of an impact it's gonna have on you. It would shock you to hear the kind of very serious, massive relationship, career, like crucial decisions I've made with a good scored pro or cons list. And if they're ever uncovered, I will die of embarrassment. But look, I'm a humanities graduate, but even I am like, I think maths is the answer. Higher score wins. Second option, make a decision. See if you can stall having to like solidify that decision completely just yet. Maybe live with it for a week and see if you get sad. It's kind of like when somebody asks you which bit of cake you want and you're like, oh, I don't care. And when they take one, you realize that that was actually the piece of cake that you really wanted. And now it's almost in their mouth. Oh, it's gone. Oh, don't want it back now. If you're one of the don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you've got until it's gone kind of Morissette style decision making maker, then this one might really work for you. The third one is making the decision as you are with the knowledge that you have and accepting that's the only way you can make a decision. One of the things that's really stalled my decision mating, mating? <laughs> Imagine if decisions could rub blubblies and make children. <laughs> I guess those things would be called consequences. <laughs> what stalled my decision making in the past has been me trying to second guess my future self, what she might want, what she might be like, what she might need. What is devastating is to realize that your future self is often quite similar to your present self and therefore kind of does agree with you on some level, even if they would have made a slightly different decision. So I think accepting that you don't have foresight and you're, you're 
gonna have to forgive your, yourself in the future if it's wrong because you can only know what you know and be who you currently are. And I think some of the most damaging decisions are made for our pictured future selves that don't yet exist. Apart from creating a pension, you should do that. And when I say you, I mean me, I should get, I should sort out my pension, especially with all these bodies around, it's making me very aware. <laughs> Death is on the way. Here he comes, riding on his sleigh. <laughs> but yeah, working out what's stalling you and if it's trying to second guess or see into the future. Forgive yourself for not being a mystic or a time traveller and just make a fucking decision. And write a note to yourself in the future to be compassionate to present you. They did the best with what they got. to my apothecary store. Perhaps you'd like some rose or pine or orange or limes or meadow sweet? What the fuck was that? Oh, it's used to make mead. Well, I mean, alcohol does help. <laughs> Don't quote me on that. Personal application only. <laughs> now, I'm gonna talk about passions in a minute, but first I wanted to address this question because it's about the dispassionate. I think sometimes there's a big emphasis at school to be really passionate about something. You get called into the career office when you're like up to here on adults and being asked like what you wanna do with the rest of your life. So I think like maybe an overemphasis on passion makes it like this really big thing in our heads, this big thing to live up to. And if you don't have a passion, then you don't have a personality now. We're now all discussing the cult of personality and how it's a little bit so I'd also like to discuss the cult of passion. Releasing you of the need to currently have a passion or have a passion all the time or still guilt for be, still being in search of your passion. I also want to put to you that maybe you do have a passion. Sometimes a passion I don't think starts out as something that you're really excited about or think is beautiful or want to be part of. Sometimes a passion could start out as something you're angry about, something you're furious about, something you really think shouldn't be a thing. That's a passion. I don't care. It's called Passion of the Christ for a reason. He wasn't cheerful. <laughs> If you're struggling to, to look for things to be angry about, I mean, I applaud you for your tranquility in time of coronavirus and climate change and a real lack of intersectionality wherever you turn. But I bet there's something in your past or even when it's just been like a debate in the pub or something that you've said to a friend, where you've realised that actually you're way more passionate or angry or frustrated about something than you realise and actually turning that energy into something positive and, and calling it what it is, which is a passion to change things. Dollop, on your plate, there you go, some passion. You got it, you already had it all along. Also, I think that passion uh, can be misunderstood in this kind of really original way where it's like it comes from within your soul somewhere and it's conflated with the idea of like original genius or like an original idea, which again we've unpacked before, but like isn't something I particularly believe in. Passions can be contagious. Sometimes you're not meant to be the spearhead of something and that's okay. I think often we get really obsessed with leaders and faces and things, but actually catching a passion <coughs> Why do I have to make like contagion jokes wherever I go this year? I can't help myself. I'm in a hospital for goodness sake. Can you find somebody whose passion you respect and help them make it a reality? But I think that can be as fulfilling as having your own passion and following it in this way because you can't, very rarely can you achieve a really cool project without some help from some other people who are obviously going to need to catch the passion to do it. So go around, see if you can catch some bugs, <laughs> metaphorically only, please. <laughs> Okay, we're gonna do three quick fire questions just to roll off some of the tongue because I have very short answers for these. <sighs> I'm fine, that wasn't a ghost, it's fine. How do you push through when you're stuck in the middle of writing a book? Now, for those of you who haven't been here for a while, I've been going on about writing a book for a long time and yeah, I've tried to write several. I'm, I've got 100,000 words of a book that I kind of now hate. <laughs> It's a whole other thing. So obviously I'm not the expert, but I have got through the middle of writing a lot of books. I've often kind of got to almost the end or the end and then, you know, obviously had a meltdown and wanted to delete it all. But the thing I find with, with books and also maybe this could apply to projects in general is that it's kind of like driving. Another thing that I'm quite bad at. Maybe this is a bad example. Kind of like driving in that you look at a car parking space and you're like, oh, I can't get in there. The front of my bonnet isn't going in there. Just doesn't work. Have you tried parallel parking, coming out for it on the side, wiggling your bum in? Have you tried doing a 10 point turn and seeing if you can maneuver yourself into a different position? Have you tried smashing up the car and then arranging it in bits in a little pile in the parking space? 
yes, I have failed three times and I still don't have a pink license. For me, scrapping it and starting again, but not starting again. So like my equivalent of the parallel park is I started writing the whole book from a different character's perspective, which gave me perspective on the book and really did help me work out what the hell was going on. So I think like, not thinking that it's just like a quick fix, um, investing a lot of time in, in getting through the middle and working out what's, what's making you happy, what's making you sad. And I often find that the method that I've used for the beginning of a project to get myself going, to get in gear, to like start things up, isn't really what works by the middle of the project. I need to either do it at a different time of day, um, organize it in a different way, break up the project into different sections in a different kind of attitude. Um, it's hard to like relate without telling you about my book, but like I think thinking laterally or, or like not approaching it how you would approach it, thinking about how maybe one of your friend's mind works, it's got a very different personality to you and being like, hmm, how would Hannah approach this project? Hannah's my friend and I knew that she would probably uh, create a spreadsheet for it. Not something that comes naturally to me, but I'll try anything when I'm trying to parallel park my life. What do I think about age different relationships? Um, I'm quite open to this as a thing. I think it's a case by case thing. I think some people can be like, no, that's gross. And obviously if they're a minor, that is gross. So sometimes people like say like somebody who's 30 and somebody who's 50 are together and people are really weirded out by that. But I have literally no idea why, because I think it comes from this idea of like, us all still being in school years. Like you ever met the person who kind of still knows what school year you'd be in in relation to them? Like you meet them and they're like, oh yeah, you'd be in the year below me. <laughs> And you're like, what the fuck, dude? Or like people who I think maybe after the age of 30 get angry at people who achieve something before them because of their age group. Once you understand even the slightest little bit of like gender, class, race, disability, equality, you'll know that like not everybody reaches the same stages in life at the same time. Uh, and that can be because of a myriad of different like reasons and life experiences. So I think as long as the two people who are together feel like they can move through the same stages of life at the same time, whether that's like mentally, like buying a house, which is something quite superficial, or just like finding a place with their careers and their passions and what they want to spend most of their days doing. If you're both like lost at that at the same time, then I think it can work. But if one of you has everything worked out and one of you doesn't, not only can that potentially create like power dynamics, but it can also just probably create a lack of similarity between your lives that I imagine would be really hard to navigate. And I think like one of the reasons I enjoy being in a partnership, a couple dumb, the boyfriend, the rent harver, <laughs> It's because you go through a lot of the same stuff together. And me and Craig, like he's four years younger than me, but we're in very similar stages of our lives mentally. He's a little bit of a grandpa and I'm still a little bit of a teenager. So I feel like we can experience the same things together and like live alongside each other in that way. The third one was uh, why should you, what was it? How do you know when it's right to move in with your partner? I'm really scared of moving in too soon, but it feels quite right. And I'm like, yeah. And I'm just speaking from like, my perspective in the world but I feel like there's this received knowledge of like when you're supposed to settle down and that moving in together is settling down because they're very different things and I don't think I'll ever really settle down I have emotional rheumatism in that I'm not going to probably not going to completely solidify my life so it can't change again um not that I'm not going to stay with Craig he's great he's going to fetch my slippers when I'm old I'm excited about it but like I think there's this generation of people who think moving in together is really serious, whereas in, in the renters generation, the like have housemates till you're like bloody 40 generation, I move in with strangers all the time. I move in with people I barely know. I like, what's the difference? Like, I don't, I think there is like a kind of thing where it's like proximity is like a nice thing to share with somebody. And I also just feel like it doesn't have to be a big deal for everybody. It is a big deal for some people and that's totally fine, but I don't care about, I'd much rather live with my significant other straight away because I'm really busy. <laughs> it's actually the only way that they really see me, which is what Craig worked out and he moved in after six months and we've been fine. So I think those kind of timelines are really like quite a construct and also just taking the idea of moving in together too seriously can, I think kind of like make you overthink something that's like you'd make on a casual basis with somebody who's just like a friend, you know? And I know that you share a bedroom most of the time, but still, I think it depends on how much you care about personal space because I do really like my alone time, but I don't, like I'm somebody who doesn't doesn't mind sharing a room. I shared a room with my brother till I was like 11. I happily just like let people in my house and I had a lot of sleepovers growing up and house parties and my house growing up was always like full of people and people temporarily living with us or staying. So my attitude to home is quite an open one and I don't mind living or sharing a space with somebody. I mean, they usually mind sharing a space with me because I'm grubby as hell, but that's, that's, that's a question for them and their therapist to work out. Am I right? I'm not right. I'm not right. I'm not right at all. I 
I present to you the forcep exhibition. How we've dragged babies from vaginas through history. What the fuck is that? I'll tell you what it is. It's a cervical dilated 19th century metal instrument with eight prongs. Smelly's perforator. Ferguson's speculum. No thank you, Ferguson. You can keep that. Filming in this part is fully a dare to myself because this is the corner that particularly creeps me out. So you're going to need to tell me if anything untoward comes from behind me, okay? <clears throat> Dear Lena, I just started a degree and I'm worried I've made the wrong choice. I feel like an imposter, like it's only a matter of time before everyone finds out how unqualified I am to be here. How do you know if something is right for you? How can we prove to ourselves that we are enough? So I'm not going to lie, when I started my degree in English literature, I... Uh, I hadn't really read that many books. <laughs> I'd always liked books. I read a lot of YA, some women's fiction, which we always say in the Miranda voice because it's not really a valid term. I remember turning up to my seminars and being so intimidated. I felt like the legally blonde in the sea of Harvard students. What, like it's hard? <laughs> I think it's important to remember that imposter syndrome is probably not related to performance at all. There are lots of people who feel very confident for a number of very confusing reasons. People talk a lot of game in first year is what I'm saying. And I also think that is really key to remember what you're there for. And here's the part that <laughs> may sound a little bit harsh to begin with. You are underqualified. You are. You're there to qualify. I think it's silly that we have to jump through so many hoops to get onto educational courses like that because you're supposed to be starting from base one. Like they, they've assessed that your mind is malleable and that you're open to it and that you have like a base understanding of things, but you are there to get qualified. You should feel confused at the beginning because you're there to start understanding. And the people who like pretend that they're already halfway there, it's kind of like, well, dude, why are you paying so much money to be here if you already know? I guess the other part of it relates to whether you should be on that course, whether it's the right thing for you. And I just kind of have to really ask you, do you care about what you're studying? Does it interest you? Would you like the thing that you're studying to become better in the context of the world? Is there parts of it that you're fascinated with that you'd like to know more about? And also, I think the thing with academia is, does being an expert interest you? Because that's what, that's what academia is. It's being a really like molecular level level eventually expert at something and there are a few questions in my dms about carrying on with academia as well and whether people should do that and obviously like i don't know you <laughs> i'm just a girl in a frilly top sitting next to an abandoned crib in a haunted hospital <laughs> But for a long time, my goal was to do a PhD. I loved learning so much that I wanted to carry on in academia. And I'm really glad that I didn't because actually, I don't want to be an expert. <laughs> I want to be the person who connects different ideas between fields. I want to be the person who remembers what it's like to not know something and be able to relay it to the person who knows a little bit less than me and be able to understand the person who knows a little bit more than me. And that's not really what academia involves. It's a lot of talking peer-to-peer -peer exchange, a lot of time on your own and a very limited amount of time relaying that information to others, which doesn't make it a bad thing, which makes it really valuable, but your place might be in a different part of the ecosystem. Do you know what I mean? I think there's a lot of people I meet who are incredibly clever, but struggle to explain their findings because they've known so much for so long that they've forgotten what it's like not to know. But going back to the first person's problem about if you're in the right place for this degree or for this thing that you're, this thing that you're studying, this thing that you're throwing time at, it could be a degree, it could be anything. If you care about what you're doing and what you're studying or what you're making, then they need you more than you need them. Sustained enthusiasm is much more rare than talent so much more rare. I'm not being funny, but you can get on the tube and be in a carriage with 10 other talented people and, and be one prod away from an incredibly talented person. Like, it's cool to be talented, but it's not unusual. Being able to sustain your enthusiasm and your passion for a long amount of time is invaluable. And um, I think that you should stay because you're way more useful. <laughs> you have a function there. Uh, rather than people who are really like naturally talented at something, but don't really care about it and abandon it in a few years. Like, we need the sticklers in this world. We need the people who stay and see the long game and um, you know <laughs> again put on your Brené Brown voice don't shrink don't puff up just stand your sacred ground stay fuck them if you enjoy it call it a party I've often done stuff where I feel like I'm not really like either welcome or I don't really fit somewhere and what I've done is pretend that I'm a spy <laughs> Now I've said that aloud, it sounds weirder than I thought, but it's true. I pretend that I'm an undercover spy and I'm trying to overhear stuff, learn about things and take notes for my secret mission. <laughs> 
Um, I've even worked in places where I've done that. That's how I've got through it because I don't agree with the ethos of the place that I'm working in. And that's just what you have to do right at the beginning of your career a lot. And it's, I don't really judge people for that. In fact, I think, anyway, that's a whole other thing. <laughs> Stop getting distracted, Lena. Belonging isn't something that you feel instantly, it's something that will come with time. And I think we um, idealise this thing where we go into like an environment or a community or a course or a job and instantly feel like you're home. That's like as romantic as, as love at first sight. It doesn't really very often happen. It happens to very few of us in this world. Most of us spend the first little term of time being like, what the fuck, where am I? Who is this? What's going on? What is real? What is real? Oh, hey, what can I get for you? I'm getting far too much into this role play. <laughs> I really think that my calling might just be like to own a pub. <laughs> I can hear you all behind the screen saying, no shit, Lena. Master of the house, quick to catch your eye. Never wants a passerby to pass him by. Comfort a philosopher and lifelong mate. I don't want to die but often I want for life to stop, to stop existing for a moment. I can't, so I cry a lot. <sighs> I really felt this one on my bones. I'm gonna get a bit serious for a minute. So I was talking about uh, this kind of idea of just wanting to disappear a bit with my friend Kat. And she told me about a book that I haven't read called Year of the Flood. It's a Margaret Atwood book. It's in the Mad Adam trilogy. Apparently there's a concept in there called the fallow year where something hard happens in their lives or just a buildup of like really hard things or exhausting things happen and people take a fallow year. It sounds like a gap year for the soul and it just involves people kind of like wintering, compassionate hibernating and like having that year off from social occasions like, oh, where's Tracy? Oh no, she's just having a fallow year this year. She's not really that contactable. And like intentionally taking a year off to just like recuperate. And I think what's been heartbreaking about this year is that it kind of like has been an opportunity a little bit to do that but also it's been under such worrying circumstances for most of us that it's hard to relax let's put it that way <laughs> and i've been reading this book um recently that's really helped me that somebody from the gumption club recommended to me called wintering and it's a memoir all about having a year of winter where you intentionally just kind of put yourself on ice basically and she said um after all you apply ice to a joint after an awkward fall why not the same to a life. So her circumstances under the, the circumstances of grief, but she talks about all these different reasons why somebody might need some real time away. I'm definitely somebody who needs alone time. And I actually kind of had that for myself where like after I um, broke off an engagement, I lived for a year on my own. And that was like really hard and really painful, but also like really healing, like to just be in the company of yourself. I have some videos about that time that I've made. You can click up there. But I think this is something that a lot of people feel that they, you know, it's not like they want to just switch life off, but they'd like to take a break from the momentum of it. And I, and I don't really have like an answer for you apart from to say like, that's totally valid. And I, I can completely understand that feeling of like, being worried that people mean that you want to die, but actually it's more that you want to just put life on ice for a while. And I think there should be more room for that. Of course, there's lots of discussions around this book, My Year of Rest and Relaxation. That book is somebody drugging themselves and sleeping for a year, but like obviously under some extreme circumstances of privilege because they can afford to just like get somebody to do their dry cleaning and, and afford to just take a year off from life and still have an apartment. But I think scaling that back and thinking of different ways you can kind of like give yourself some time is totally normal. And I think it's okay to need to dig for the will to live. And that's not to say that you don't want to live, but like the will to, and that's very different from like the belief that you should. Will is like a kind of, you know, it, it has like a bit of like kinetic energy in it. Like you kind of do have to find it a little bit. There's this passage from Wintering that says, somewhere in the depths, I found a seed of a will to live. Its tenacity surprised me. More than that, it made me strangely optimistic. Winter had blanked me, blasted me wide open. In all that whiteness, I saw the chance to make myself new again. Half apologetic, I started to build a different kind of person, one who was rude sometimes and didn't always do the right thing, whose big stupid heart made her endlessly seem to hurt, but also one who deserved to be here because she now had something to give. And I've also been laughing a bit because I rewatched um, About a Boy and uh, the kind of like very classic parts of that where he's like, life is a series of units, a bath, one unit, countdown, two units. Um, but there's something true to that, I think. And um, Amos Oz put this really well. I kind of like loved it so much I copied it out. No man is an island, says John Donne, but I humbly dare to add to this. No man and no woman is an island, but every one of us is a peninsula, half attached to the mainland, half facing the ocean 
half connected to family and friends and culture and tradition and country and nation and sex and language and many other ties and the other half just wants to be left alone to face the ocean. He goes on to talk about how like the condition of being human is to be a peninsula and we deserve the space to remain that way if we want and um, I guess that can probably tie into like discussions on codependency and like intense community but I think it's okay to ask for that to put yourself on ice for a little bit ask that of yourself ask that of others and that you know most of us can't give up actually working for a year which is why I will read the year of rest and relaxation but like not now <laughs> but I wonder if there's just parts of parts of your life where you can intentionally be your true peninsula self because I don't think that you can just like lily pad from being one person to another if you feel like you really need to assess who you are and and kind of turn into somebody a little bit different. You can't just do that while running forward. You can't just like quickly hop from one place, one personality lily pad to another. You do have to like take some time to strip it back and that's totally okay. And if you're crying a lot, I'd like to prescribe you some limes. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, I think that that's a massive post-it note from your brain that you need to play, make a plan for that. And often you can't just stop your life straight away. Looking into the next few months and, and working out where um, some little pockets of winter can be made. Sounds super healthy. Uh, now that's gonna be 325, please. <laughs> I wish there was a till down here. God, I'm just a 30 year old who wants to play shop. Thank you for coming to Lena's Apocrity of Existential Ailments. And thank you in particular to the old Operating Theatre Museum. As I'm sure you guys can appreciate, they haven't been able to operate in the way that they usually would. So if you enjoyed your virtual visit today, do consider donating to them. And they also have a really cool online shop, so I'm gonna leave the links to those below. And maybe if you're ever around London in post-COVID times, you'll come and take a look because it is beautiful. And not one ghost has touched me, so. More Agony Aunt videos up here. YouTube thinks you'll like this video. Subscribe if you'd like to find yourself here again. And thank you so much for watching. Frog Snog out.